In this episode of Opel GT Power, we're going to talk all about the engineering of the Opel GT suspension. Let's get to it. Before we get started with this series of videos on the engineering of the Opel GT, it's important for us to know where this car is coming from, what its competition was, and who its target audience was. A lot of that really changes how the engineers will design a car. So I'm just going to use this uh, article from Road and Track to kind of give an idea of what the competition was here. We have a Fiat 124, uh, MGB GT, Triumph GT6 Mark III, and uh, the Datsun 240Z. Most magazines admit that the Datsun 240Z is kind of in its own class above all of these other cars. And if you accept that, um, the Opel GT and most of these magazine articles becomes the either the uh, first or the second in its class. Sometimes the Fiat beats it, sometimes it doesn't. It just depends on what magazine you're reading, like uh, Road and Track, uh, the Fiat beat it, even though the Opel GT had more points. Uh, Car and Driver, something similar. Um, but either way, the Opel GT runs along very well with these other cars in its class, except for the 240Z. Um, but I typically argue that the 240Z kind of spoke to a different kind of person than the quirky little Opel GT. All these cars are have very similar characteristics. The Opel GT was priced at $3,306. Uh, the average price of a car back in that day was about $3,560 uh, in 1970. Uh, so, every one of these cars, except for the Datsun 240Z, um, had a sticker price that was uh, less than the average of um, average cost that someone would spend on the car back then. So, these are affordable, cheap, entry-level sports cars. They all had pretty close to the same weight distribution. You're talking like 54 to 46 for the, for the Opel, for example. Um, and they all weighed about the same amount of weight. Uh, the Opel GT was the lightest at uh, 2,100 pounds, about. The Opel GT had the best cornering out of its class, except for the Datsun, of course, which was a, a, a whole level above them. The Opel GT had the best brakes in its class. It was able to stop better than any of the um, cars, including the Datsun. Uh, the GT had the second best acceleration of all those cars in its class as well, of a zero to 60 of 11.9 seconds. So remember that when you're talking about the Opel GT's bad performance. Out of these, uh, these cars in its class, it's better and almost exactly the same as the rest of them, uh, except for the Datsun, which is three seconds faster. Um, it was also the most fuel efficient uh, in this particular test. It got 26 mpg. Anyway, that's the basics of where this car is coming from. So let's, let's go to the garage and uh, talk, about, talk about how the suspension was designed for this part of the video. In later parts of the video, we'll move on and talk about um, the engine, uh, the body, and more things along those lines. All right, so we're underneath uh, my 1970 Opel GT now, and I'm going to tell you guys about the engineering and design of this uh, suspension system. So the rear end is really nothing special at all in the GT. Uh, it's just a typical live axle design. You have uh, tubular shocks, which are nice, and uh, as you can see, they're, they're placed at an angle in the GT, which I don't really like. I'd like to see them more at like a five degree angle or vertical. And uh, all the Opel GT race teams change these to vertical, but uh, probably a, more of a comfort-oriented design. And uh, we have coil springs, uh, which are nice. My Opel GT here has a sway bar, rear sway bar, but none of the US GTs came with a sway bar. I believe all the European ones did, but I guess they, they think that Americans hate handling so much they just decide to take it off. and the Opel GT has to have a rear sway bar. It, just, it understeers so badly without one. Um, this, is, this is something I recommend that everybody upgrade on their car. See, we have uh, rear drum brakes. Uh, nothing special about them. Just a very simple, tried and true design. They work fine. 
So the Opel GT rear suspension comes from the Opel Cadet from a few years before it came around. Here's a closer look at the brakes I mentioned and a nice side view of the, um, the rear end here. These are very dirty because I haven't had them open in several years. Um, these are the stock brakes. Um, we have a rear pan hard rod, also a tried and true design that's been used for decades and is still used today on cars. Um, ideally, a sports car like this would have a Watts link, um, but honestly, it's really not necessary. And uh, this is an entry level sports car, so it's not not going to have a lot of the features like that. The pan hard rod, essentially, if you don't know what it is, uh, the way this works is you have a mount on the um, the suspension and you have a mount on the body and uh, this thing's job is to keep the suspension centered whenever it goes up and down and it does a pretty good job of this of course since it's a single connection it's not perfect but it, it does a pretty decent job at what it's doing what it's designed to do of keeping the axle centered so the rear end here has a drain plug at the bottom which uh you wouldn't think that that would be a question, but uh, Opal doesn't like to put drain plugs on some things like the transmission. Um, so this is nice. And uh, the rear axle here is uh, just a your typical non-limited slip. So it's got 3.44 uh, rear gears and there's absolutely nothing good about it. It can only handle about, um, you know, 150 horsepower safely without any risk of blowing it up. I mean, even the, with the stock torque and horsepower, these things had issues. So yeah, just keep that in mind whenever you're upgrading your car. My favorite thing about the Opel GT rear end though is the torque tube here. So you can see it runs all the way back to this, uh, to this mount here and then the drive shaft goes into it here. So this thing's job is to keep the axle from twisting, much like a torque arm set up on like a, you know, a, uh, like a muscle car. And so this is the third link in the three link suspension system here. Uh, so as you can see, you have your drive shaft, you have a beefy bushing here that is uh, very often gets destroyed. You have a, a lower bushing here and an upper bushing, and then you have these two beefy support guys that are often damaged and need to be replaced. Um, it's honestly a pretty good design. These, these torque tubes need to be stronger, uh, I would say, but it's, it's a good design. I like it personally. The, um, the rear trailing arms here, are, or control arms, are rolled steel. Um, otherwise, they're a very typical design, no adjustment, but the rolled steel is a huge negative because these uh, tend to get water in them and they rust. And then, uh, as you can see here, there's a, there's a gap where they're rolled. And then uh, once they lose some of that structural integrity, you know, when, when one part of the suspension goes up, the other part of the suspension is going to go down, and so that means that these are going to twist. And um, twisting something that's rolled and rusted, and you're going to end up actually permanently twisting it, and these get damaged a lot. It's wasn't they should not have done rolled steel on them. The wheels are technically suspension components, so I'll say a little bit about them. From the factory, the Opel GTs came with 165 R13 bias ply tires. Very skinny, and uh, the grip on the cars could be greatly improved by putting 185s on it, like my car has. Um, so they're just these are very heavy, just steel wheels. And I love, I love, love, love the design of these with the the nice little chrome trim ring they put on the outside, and then the little moon dish uh, with the opal symbol in them. I I have these wheels on all my GTs, and the only time I switch them out is when I go to the track. So here's a, here's a look at it without the little moon thing on it, and I just got through painting these. So here's the, the inside too. They're five and a half inches wide, and they weigh like 
a ridiculous amount of pounds. So there's a lot of unsprung weight there. All right, so here's the front suspension. So we'll start from the engine bay. So underneath all my AC hoses, well, let's look on this side instead. Uh, there's, the, uh, there's the shock support there. As you can see it's very low in the engine bay and doesn't take up any space. You know, a lot of cars you'll see these are all the way up here. And um, one of the reasons for this we'll get to in a minute. But the suspension design, so we have our front disc brakes here, which are very nice. Uh, they are able to stop the Opel GT faster than any of the sports cars in its class at its, at its time. And uh, we have tubular shocks, uh, unequal length control arms. But what is holding up the suspension? It has a transverse leaf spring under the suspension. And this is one of the biggest talking points about the Opel GT um, amongst owners and just people that's, that know that it's designed like this. Like, what were they thinking? This is like 1920s and 1930s car design. Uh, not quite, although it is very antiquated. So this suspension is from uh, the Opel Cadet, um, which was an affordable, um, more of a family type car. They, they came in a, a, a caravan style. They came in um, sedans, uh, coupes, all, all kinds of different styles of the Cadet. And they were wonderful little cars. Um, kind of a competitor the Beetle and other small cars at that time. But the Cadets were not sports cars. So we have a non-sports car suspension in this car. So why is this? Why did the engineers do this? Well, it's really not their fault. Um, the, uh, the bean counters at Opel, they, they wanted to keep this car cheap and they were, you know, they were aiming for a price point even lower than it actually ended up. Um, they were aiming for below that uh, $3,000 for this car. Uh, it wasn't achievable, but they did really good um, making it to where the 1.9 liter version was $3,395. Um, the 1.1 liter was uh, around $3,295. It was about $100 difference between the two engines. Um, so this was a very affordable car at its time. But this transverse leaf spring design, um, aside from the cost, I'm gonna kinda go into why the engineers might have chosen this. Um, but what the Opel GT engineers really wanted was to wait for the Opel Manta suspension to come out and modify it to work on the GT. The Opel Manta suspension is well known to be one of the best handling uh, suspensions in its class at its time. Um, it used a coil spring and still had unequal length control arms and it was just a really great design, kind of competed with the Ford Capri of its time. And the people at Opel didn't want to wait for that so it, we got this. One of the positives of this design is that the leaf spring here, since it connects to the lower control arms on both sides, it kind of has a little bit of roll resistance to it, so it kind of acts like a sway bar in some ways. So that ex that's one of the reasons why uh, Opel GTs didn't come with a front sway bar unless you're, they were optioned for it. And I don't think you could even option the US GTs for a front sway bar. I think it was only Euro GTs. Um, a negative to that is since the, uh, the US Opel GTs didn't get a rear sway bar, um, having this extra roll stiffness in the front uh, makes these cars understeer even worse, even though it's slightly less rolling, I guess. Uh, another benefit, uh, as I was saying earlier, the shock towers don't go up very high in the engine bay, and this uh, leaf spring design kind of contributes to that a lot. Uh, you don't have to have a huge support structure up here, um, you know, for a tubular shock, this doesn't really have much force going through it um, comparatively to a, a coil spring um, because this here is taking a lot of the load and transferring it in, up into the body um, from the cross member here. And so you get a much more compact design uh, and it's a, a very light design for a steel um, subframe here. Uh, you can drop out this entire suspension without taking out apart anything except for the, the brakes and the steering shaft pretty much and drop it out. Uh, two people can carry it over to a workbench and work on it. It's super simple. There are other cars that use this design. 
In fact, the Corvette C5 and C6 um, uh, have a transverse leaf spring in the front that's very similar to this. The, the main difference with those is that it's mounted uh, on top of the um, cross member. The way it's done on the GT here, since it's tied at the bottom on both sides, uh, when the suspension is going up and down, uh, this, these leaf springs are changing length and binding on each other. And um, it really destroys these bushings that, on the uh, spring eye here. It's just um, not the greatest design of all time. But uh, like I said, the, uh, the Corvette uses, uh, uses a similar design. Um, for a bunch of the reasons I mentioned, for example, it makes the, the Corvette um, suspension able to fit in a smaller package and makes it a little bit easier to deal with um, on a small, you know, a relatively small car like the Corvette for GM. That's another thing the Corvette style has going for it though, is it has a composite leaf as opposed to these um, heavier steel leaves. So if, if you swap these over to composite, um, they become stronger, uh, you get better spring rates out of them, and uh, a lot of a lot less unsprung weight. So there are some possible benefits with um, with this design if it's done right. There is definitely room for modifications here for people who um, have a knack for that sort of thing. And this suspension was able to um, put some Porsches to shame in Group 4 racing back in the days when the Opel race teams like Steinmetz and Conrero were rolling around out there. But it takes a lot of modification, like I said. Okay, so more about the rest of the suspension. So the engineers at Opel, uh, they used rack and pinion for this, uh, which is great because, um, you know, for a, an affordable entry-level sports car like this, it's a uh, that's um, a really good feature to have, and a lot of cars in this price point at, at, at the same time didn't have that. Um, so you get a nice steering feel with the GT. The tubular shocks are also nice, um, and the, uh, the disc brakes in the front are exceptional. Um, the lack of a um, front sway bar is a horrible misstep um, by Opel. It really needs it. This, this car rolls so bad, but if you don't have a rear sway bar, don't put on a front one because you'll get even worse oversteer, even though it'll be more comfortable sometimes. Um, the control arm design is uh, fine. Uh, I'm, they're pretty flimsy though, and uh, a lot of people have trouble with them bending. Uh, Opel, is this a problem with Opel using, you know, the parts from a cheap uh, family car instead of um, beefing some things up? Um, caster is adjustable with shims um, and this upper control arm. Uh, there is almost no adjustment to uh, um, camber though. Uh, you can flip this ball joint and get a couple degrees and um, different, but that's that's about it. This isn't a very adjustable suspension and it's um, without a lot of modifications. It, it's not really a great suspension for a sports car but it does have its benefits and it does work fine. Really the biggest win on the suspension side from Opel is that uh, they were able to convince, uh, the engineers were able to convince Opel to move the engine back in the car. Uh, it's where the suspension cross member is its own separate piece and the engine has its own cross member. So it's a, technically a, um, a front mid-engine design and that really helps with the weight distribution of this car. It's not great as it is, but it's also not bad at 54 to 46. They definitely did some things right on this car. That concludes this episode of Opel GT Power, about the engineering of the Opel GT suspension. In a, a, about a week and a half, probably, I'll have up another video about the engine of the GT, which I know a lot more about, so it will be good.